Welcome to the Parenting Power Podcast, supporting parents with the real-life tools they need to raise the confident, interdependent people the world needs. Gail Bell and Julie Friedman-Smith interview experts who share their knowledge to assist parents in creating a home environment where kids can thrive. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Life Parenting Podcast. This is Julie Friedman-Smith. And I'm Gail Bell. Today's podcast is brought to you by Beaner's Fun Cuts for Kids. Parenting is hard, haircuts shouldn't be. Visit beanersfuncuts.com for a location near you. We followed the work of today's guest, Dr. Michael Unger, for years as he has taught parents all over the world about the importance of resilience. Michael is the founder and director of the Resilience Research Center at Dalhousie University. His new book is called Change Your World, The Science of Resilience and the Path to Success. We are so excited to speak with you. Welcome, Michael. It's great to be here. Thanks for this. Michael, can you please tell us a little more about this new book? Yeah. It's been a lot of fun pulling together all the different emerging ideas, both the research and also my clinical work that I've been doing with families, not just in Canada, the U.S., but also around the world, and trying to figure out how exactly we build resilience, especially in children and youth. And what that science is pointing to is a little bit surprising, because so often what we talk about is that somehow resilience is inside of us, or that it's just about grit or positive thinking or positive attitude. And actually, where the science is going now is more and more towards understanding that if you can change the world around our kids, we're much more likely to, in fact, make them resilient. So that's really the focus of the book. It's sort of turning the self-help idea on its head and saying that the real reason we are able to fix ourselves or the real reason our kids are able to change their behaviors, their thinking, their attitudes, overcome bullying, doing whatever they, they need to do is often more about what they're given or the resources they receive than simply their own individual ruggedness. I could actually give you some really interesting examples that I've been learning from families on this. So as much as we constantly try to say to kids, self-regulate, control your emotion, meditate, all these kinds of things, which, by the way, are, are great instructions to give kids, but they're unlikely, according to the science, to actually be sustained as change in our kids' lives unless we also sort of change the world around them. So if you want your child to self-regulate and they basically not be gaming on lying so much, well, we as parents have to remember that we're the ones who often have control over the internet in our homes, right? We're the ones paying for it. We're the ones who can turn it off at a certain time at night. If you're upset with your child, say, taking their phone or not getting enough sleep, which we know that our children should be getting more sleep, at least eight to nine hours a night if possible, certainly as teenagers. And I hear so many parents complaining that they just can't get their child to sort of do this. And what I'm actually understanding is that what we need to then think about is, well, no, it's, it's our role as parents to create, well, the structure and the natural consequences around our children. So we are the ones who basically say, we're going to ask that you not take your phone into your room. And since most of us parents are actually paying for those cell phone plans or those smartphone plans, I think that it's a reasonable request in our child. So in each of these examples, if you will, there's great science to say that as we as parents, if we want to give our kids an edge in terms of their own self-help, in terms of them self-regulating, learning how to control their emotions, being more civil, being more engaged. These are all things that we can actually create really resource-rich environments. So I'd like to say it's not just about being a rugged individual, it's also about being a well-resourced individual. And that's the real secret to resilience. Oh man, you are singing to the choir. <laughs> Julie and I could not agree with you more. Some of the things you just shared with us, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. So thank you for that. And thank you that our audience can now hear that as well. Because Julie and I have always said, you can't control your child and you don't want to control your child. However, you can control your response to your children. So you stay calm and you say, no, these are the expectations. And you can absolutely control the environment in which your child grows up. And as you just gave us so many awesome examples about setting them up for success, here's the limit. Here's what you can do. Here's what's not acceptable. 
Absolutely. I'll give you a very funny example, which I've come across. I did a lot of talking to all kinds of people, doing lots of things with kids all around the world. And a colleague of mine who does work out of Winnipeg, he's actually one of these fellows who's trying to get kids to move more. That He's one of those focused very much on trying to get kids to increase their physical activity and this type of thing. And he did a very interesting experiment with some elementary school kids. He put these accelerometers on the kids for one week to get some baseline ideas. Okay, so basically how much were they moving and how fast were they moving? And then on the weekend, he went in with his, with his uh, students and he actually painted hopscotches on the floor of the elementary school. That's all he did. The next week, they measured the amount of steps that the kids were taking and the speed at which they were moving. And guess what? That small adaptation in the environment around the kids increased how much they move and how fast they move. And it makes sense, right? I mean, what child, in fact, what adult, can walk down a hallway and not, if they see a hopscotch, begin to bounce around and move a little bit faster? Now, that, that's a silly little experiment, but it actually works so that if we begin to think about, well, if you're driving your child to school and you want them to be more active, where exactly are you dropping them off? Or indeed, are we talking about where I've met lots of parents who are doing these amazing things with walking school buses where a bunch of parents are getting together and helping their kids to sort of have more exercise naturally built into their day. In other words, changing the world around the kids so that the child's actually obligated to move a bit more. These are the kinds of solutions that I'm finding are are really powerful and, in fact, are really good science-based ideas that will, as I say, increase the the physical health, the mental health, the, the mood of our kids. Oh, that is such a great point, because even that small change of are you dropping them off at the door or are you dropping them off a block from the school has a huge impact over time. That's just so interesting. I never, ever thought of that before you just said it. I need to go back to something you said, Michael, because I just want to expand and hear your thoughts on this. You said something like, because most of us as parents are paying for our kids' cell phones, it doesn't seem to be anything wrong with us requiring them to not have them in their rooms. And The reality is that I'm hearing from a lot of parents who say, well, my child saved up for their computer. My child saved up for his phone. So he feels like he has absolute jurisdiction over what happens with that device in our house. And our language is always when it's a child in your home, the rules in your home apply. So whether or not you paid for the phone, you still get to decide what the rules are of its use. And I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's a little bit more of a dynamic there, though. So there's also an element of then, let's let's take it. If you have a child, though, who's together enough to, say, have a small job, uh, yeah. I'm assuming, by the way, that this money that they're getting, let's assume that it's not just being given to them as birthday money from the grandparents. Exactly. If that's, that's a big case, assumption because that is the case much of the time. But anyway, let's make that assumption okay. for now. <laughs> let's, if it's not that, because if it is that, then in fact, it's not really money that the child had to have the skill set to to earn. But if you're talking about a child who's, say, hold down a small job or is doing something in the neighborhood to earn a little bit of extra money, and they are, in a sense, self-regulated enough, they are responsible enough, they are structured enough to to do all the right things to get that money then to buy the cell phone, then my guess is they're probably mature enough at that point to actually make some more decisions about if you bring the cell phone into your bedroom and it's binging and it's going off all night, then you're not going to get much sleep and that's going to decrease your marks. And at some point, I mean, there's a little bit of a negotiation with a child to say, especially I'm thinking more of a teenager here, of course, where, yeah. where are they willing to, in a sense, suffer the consequences? Now, I'm assuming a child who's already holding down a job and earning their own money probably has it figured out enough to sort of have that little experiment happen. But... If the child is just being handed all these resources, all these things, right, and that's maybe setting them up for failure if they, because we know that when they go to bed, if, if the phone is constantly pinging and they're, they're constantly upset by how many likes they're getting, et cetera, et cetera, we know very well that that is compromising their functioning all day long. And that seems reasonable for a parent to set, step in and say, we need some structure here. I'm going to help you until you can sort of get this in check and do this on your own. But it should be incremental, of course, is that, as I say, a child who's taking on much more responsibility for themselves in their life is probably ready to also make some decisions about their own cell phone. But that is so seldom the case, I find, where where the parent is actually still, even if the child bought the phone, it's the parent still paying paying the monthly fee for the phone plan. Or there's usually some sort of thing that's saying to the child, you're not quite ready to fly completely on your own. And therefore, I'm going to help you set some reasonable limits, just like hopefully you're modeling. By the way, let's face it, changing your world, changing a child's world 
also means modeling for that child good mental and physical health hygiene regimes in our own lives as adults. So are we turning off our phone at night so we can get a better night's sleep? Are we bringing our phone to the dining room table? I'm amazed by the number of kids that I meet who say they feel actually digitally neglected in a sense. They, are, they feel like it's their parents who they wish sometimes would turn off their devices and actually pay more attention to the child, even if the, the child had to be told, turn off that device, I want to spend some quality time with you. Yes, we are absolutely seeing the same thing and won't deny that it worries us. And we are talking about it to our clients and to the and public when we're really speaking that this is something we have to be very aware of. It's not to blame or shame us, but it's to become aware of and make changes with yourself, with your children and as a family. There's really it, it, a lack of connection time we're finding. Oh, absolutely. And just to also, like I find in my work on resilience, that it's not just this one battle over providing a child enough sleeping time, enough structure or their cell phones. I'm finding it also is about broadening that conversation. So, so for instance, we know in around the world, one of the biggest indicators for a sense of family cohesion and a sense of belonging for a child is whether or not the family eats together three times a week. And I'm amazed by the number of parents who sort of will let that not happen. Everyone's in front of the television or their devices are on at the dinner table. And it's really about offering a child a focused time in that sort of nurturing setting of the, of the dinner to actually just have a spontaneous conversation. And I, I'll hear parents say, well, my child's kind of surly. They just sit there, they grunt, and then they want to leave the table. But part of that is also us modeling for them, telling the child about our day about talking about meaningful things in our lives, planning the next vacation or something that's going on around the house. I also love, even if you want to go further, to change the child's world so that it's, it's much more of an experience being at the table, how often do we ask children, especially, again, teenagers, to once a week actually contribute to the cooking of a meal, to really do something that... that so, I mean, you've got to admit, when you go to the table and you know that the, you know, the, 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 the broccoli and the, the pie or something you made, you're much more, you're probably going to say to other people, hey, turn off your phone. I just made this. Eat, you know, like I want you <laughs> focused here, you know, yeah. and it's because of that buy-in, that real genuine sense of responsibility. I, I love, I live on the East Coast and I joke that out here, we have a casserole culture. By that, I mean, look, someone down the, if someone, my neighbor uh, falls down and breaks her hip, she gets a casserole or two or three. The yep. neighborhood just swarms around. If there's somebody, if there's been a death in the family, if a child is ill, we swap casseroles, a lot of casseroles in where I live. And I'm sure there's other communities just like that. But my point is that you don't just swap the casserole. You get your kid to be involved in making the casserole, or if they're too young to make the casserole, they're probably not too young to bring the casserole over to the person next door and to really feel a part of that community and like they're making a genuine contribution. And here again, it's one thing to tell a child, I really want you to feel like you belong, which is a feeling state or a thinking state. And that puts a lot of responsibility on the child to sort of think differently versus giving them a genuine opportunity that puts them in connections with others, that forces them to talk to their neighbors and really do something to light up someone's face. When you do that, what we're understanding is whether it's neurologically or psychologically, we know that that actually changes our children's capacities to attach and grow and, and ultimately, I'm hoping, become much more like contributing members of, of their communities, which is ultimately what we want. So interesting. So many different ways that you're providing these, as you said in the beginning, these resources for our kids. So often when I hear the word resource, I think a workbook or an iPad or a device but I don't think that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the resources we're providing for our kids. So I know you've already shared some with us. Tell us some of the other key ways that parents can help their kids to build resilience and perhaps what some more of those resources are. Yeah. In the work I've been doing, I keep seeing re these resources, or if you prefer the word experience. Um, mm. We can, as parents, for instance, give our child, no matter what their capacities or strengths an opportunity to show their talents. In other words, can we hand our children a positive and powerful identity that they can actually say, this is something special about me. And that could be on the weekends, spending some time with their grandparents and suddenly doing some hobby or interest that, that's much more in tune with them. 
I also like to think that we can give ch children experiences of power and control so they can make some decisions that are meaningful in their own lives. We can definitely help them to find fair treatment and teach them about how to advocate for their rights. <laughs> Maybe not too much at home, <laughs> but, <laughs> but definitely out there in the world. <laughs> anyway, we can, we can debate that a little bit. Yep. Um, but that notion of how do you stand up for yourself? How do you sort of negotiate? How do you talk to strangers? Giving our children opportunities so they're not anxious out there in the world. I want my child to talk to strangers, like not the really strange strangers, but to be able to go into a coffee shop and order their own hot chocolate or something if they're nine years old is a perfectly reasonable request, especially if we're just sort of staying outside or something while we're out walking the dog or something like that. And I also see it very important for our children to have a sense that they belong somewhere. That might be through a religious institution, that might be through an extended family, some sort of thing that the family does all together. And of course, let's face it, our children need a sense of their culture, whatever that culture is. Maybe it's just how we celebrate birthdays or how we celebrate the holidays in December or how we, I mean, how we ritualize certain things or the fact that we're maybe we're, we're Indo-Canadian or African-American or from a Central American country or whatever, that whatever we are, that in a sense, the identities that we bring into our homes, how do we also give those to our children so they can anchor themselves to something that they know is, is, is a part of themselves, that they have some sense that my life has a bigger meaning. It's, it's across generations. And I always find that all of these things, if you notice, each of these are experiences that we as parents control by teaching our children the foods of their ancestors, how to cook a traditional meal, to celebrate certain ways on the holidays, to get them involved in decorating the house for those particular events, at attending events in the community. These are all things that we, as adults, create for our children. And the remarkable thing, the science is so clear, when we do this, we create a child who's more hopeful about the future, much more tolerant of others, much more self-regulated, and a child that really does tend to avoid some of those big, nasty problems, drug abuse, sexual promiscuity or high-risk sexual behaviors when they're teenagers, so dropping out of school, all the things that we really do worry about, they're well within our control as parents to create environments rich in resources, rich in opportunities for children to, in fact, be their best and boldest selves. Michael, we always ask our guests if they could share one real-life parenting tool that they've used in their home that's just worked wonderfully. Well, I've already talked a little bit about the dinner and getting kids to cook, and that's certainly one of them. But since I've already talked about that, the other one which I love is getting kids to do the shopping with me. And the reason I use that one is because so often in homes, the kinds of battles that I hear siblings getting into is who ate that last bag of chips? Why did you get more of that than this? Or I don't like the food. You never buy the kind of apples I like, or you never, I would eat that if. You get into endless food battles, endless parts of this. And I think that part of that is that we don't educate our children to become part of that food production process. And I always say, look, if, if you're having battles over junk food, figure out what your junk food budget is. And every family has one. Go to the store, drag your child along and say, look, you want junk food this week, then here's the 20 bucks that we spend each week on this. It's the pop and the chips or whatever it is. You go select it. And I've learned from many families that when they experiment like this, usually the first week the child buys the most expensive stuff that the parents never buy, and they realize that it's gone by Thursday sort of thing, right? <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it only that much money doesn't buy a lot of sort of very fancy uh, high-priced stuff. But the week after, if you do it multiple weeks, by the second or third week, the child's going into the store and suddenly they, they discover that you can buy an awful lot of fruit roll-ups or doodles or some sort of chips or whatever in the no-name brands. Now, that's great for educating our children about responsible decision-making, about money management, and indeed, it begins to get them involved in the family. Now, of course, that experiment was about the junk food. You can expand that with time to talk about what vegetables we're going to cook. Let's talk about a healthier diet. Let's talk about what do you want to buy chicken this week or would you like to buy beef? When you begin to actually engage them in these real processes, they actually become much more responsible. And indeed, what best of all is they're going to be ready to go off to college or university or to indeed live on their own or eventually have a spouse of their own. And they might actually just be a really good catch as a consequence of this. How beautiful. You've really talked about so many different resources slash experiences that we have the power to make happen for our kids. And it's not rocket science. It's not like these are costly things. This is intentional, thoughtful 
ways of helping our kids to grow and learn. And that's just bang on the money for us to hear and for our listeners to hear. It's been so wonderful speaking with you today and learning more from you. If listeners want to find out more information from you, where is the best place for them to follow you? I have a website, michaelunger.com, and it's U-N-G-A-R for Unger. And of course, the new book is uh, coming out, Change Your World. Lots of really good ideas, as well as really trying to anchor to the science so that we set parents up for success in their parenting practices. Thank you so much, Michael. I can't wait to read your book. I appreciate the opportunity, Gail, Julie. All the best to you and, and indeed the families who are listening as well. To learn more about Parenting Power, check out our website, parentingpower.ca, visit our Facebook page, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Parenting Power.